All right, welcome Matt Wilson to the Edge of Comfort podcast. Really excited to have you on. I think uh, I've been trying to talk to you for the last two months and get a time organized when we could uh, have this conversation. So thank you for joining me today. And uh, how's everything going in Austin, Texas, where you guys are headquartered at? Good, good, Lee. Thank you very much for having me. Great. Um, so a lot of questions for you today. I know we have about an hour time slot, so try to uh, keep it keep it uh, focused in a certain area. But I think a great place to start is on your podcast as well, since kind of we're both podcasters. And so your podcast is called the Live Different Podcast. And it kind of focuses around business, travel, health, performance. So I'm curious just to kind of start what does living different mean to you in your own life? You know, what is different from what, you know, what are the ways that you try to live different in your own life? Sure. Um, so I think that, so I've been podcasting for the last, coming up on four years now. And, uh, you know, I've had the unique opportunity to interview people who, not to be cliche, but... Uh, who kind of live and think outside of the box, who are not following the normal path that society tells you to. And I think that's the most important, that's the overarching uh, theme of the show and really what I try to accomplish in my own life. And it's not just to be different for the sake of being different, uh, or, or just to be a contrarian, to be argumentative, uh, for example, but trying to forge my own path and encourage other people to actually take a deep look uh, within themselves and uh, externally at the world around them and see, try to see what's really going on in the world because it's not what the media and the government and the corporations and all of these things are telling us, uh, nor probably our parents or teachers or our own egos and our own minds. So when it comes to health or travel or performance or business, these topics have thought leaders you know, um, incredible thought leaders and, and mavericks of the different industries. And people have just gone out and uh, decided to be innovative and make a life for themselves that is really on their own terms, rather, again, than what society told them to do. So where does that mindset and that desire to live like that come from you? You know, can you... Is there a point in your life where you can kind of trace that back to maybe this mindset shift? Or do you remember just kind of always being that way from childhood? Like, where has this kind of stemmed from for you? And how have you pursued that in your own pursuits? That's a good question. Uh, so on the entrepreneurial front, I can proudly say that I've been a lifelong enterprising human being because I can remember having, with the lemonade stands and with the lawn mowing businesses and picking the golf balls out of the uh, local pond at the golf course or you know I I knew which uh, <laughs> which way the right-handed golfers would slice the ball into what patch <laughs> of woods and I'd go out there and pick those balls and and ended up selling them on eBay and uh, that kind of so that was always ingrained in me um, but I had the the one thing that really popped out in my mind, to be to be honest, and uh, hopefully my my dad wouldn't mind me sharing, but I can remember him being so frustrated growing up that he only had two weeks off a year, and he wanted to spend those two weeks how he wanted to spend them, and it, it was really frustrating for him. And you know, I can I can count the holidays. Uh, you know, on my on my hand, one or two hands that he would actually have off from work. And he just worked a regular corporate job uh, for the most part uh, until he got a little bit older and semi-retired and started actually doing things that he wanted to do. And 
that really, I think he really ingrained that in me. And unfortunately, it was because of a lot of the really suffering that he had to go through, I think, uh, because that, that was not easy for him. And he always really did want to follow his soul's calling. But yeah, he, he didn't really get, uh, well, to be completely honest with you, he didn't get to do that until really late in life. And then he got sick and uh, he's still out there, you know, sailing and doing the things that he loves, but he's not very mobile. And it's these things are really difficult uh, for him, but still gets out on the boat and uh, does the best he can. So uh, that was ingrained in me at a very young age, I guess, that I wanted to to go out and, and make sure I lived life to the fullest and not waited until tomorrow. Yeah, I think that is a, mind sh- a mindset that more people in our generation are having because they see maybe some people in the older generation who have lived their life like that two weeks off a year, and it's just not appealing to us anymore. We're more willing to risk the the safety of and stability of that corporate job to go out and maybe forge your own path and do something and live life on your own terms. So I'm curious, have you, I'm, you went to Bryant University, is that yes. correct? Okay. And so graduated right around the major recession in 2008. So were you ever, did you ever feel like there was a lot of pressure on yourself, maybe from friends or parents or even from yourself to kind of get into that corporate life and that safety net? And, you know, you went to college, you got your degree, good amount of money spent on that. Why would you not pursue what you went there to do or unless you did go to entrepreneurial school? But I believe that they didn't even have that as a major when you started there. So, you know, why wouldn't you use that to your advantage and go get that cushy corporate job? Well, Lee, I, I think you've done your research, which is great. So I appreciate that. And uh, I would probably call it a bad amount of money that I spent at <laughs> at school and nothing against Bryant University. Uh, and they are still very supportive of uh, my ventures. And in fact, we're partnered to, to run a trip for the alumni program. Uh, but I think if you speak to any professor there or any administrator there or Ron Makeley, the president of the institution, they'll tell you that that is just a ridiculous amount of money that we're spending on higher education as individually, as individuals, as a country, and that there are a lot of other ways to be able to to do it. And uh, that I believe higher education is really going to have to innovate because fortunately they're teaching the same way. If you went to, I don't know, if you went to Bryant University in 1863, the year it was founded, I'm glad that just popped into my head. <laughs> they, they're they probably teaching the classes just about the same way. I, and, and don't get me wrong, there's technology in in the classrooms, but it's mainly lectures and team projects and, you know, cool stuff. Don't get me wrong. Bryant is a very innovative place, but the money that they have to spend now to keep up with all of the institutions contributes to this rising cost of education. But the education model is mainly, okay, go and select your 15 credits for the year and, uh, or for the semester rather, and you have to show up to class from point A to, you know, from this time to this time, either two or three times a week. Uh, and that model could use more innovation. So that was, sorry, that was a little bit of a <laughs> uh, side topic on, on higher education. But yes, Bryant, especially when I got there in 2004, honestly was a very corporate place. And a lot of people would probably argue that it still is, although there has been a massive shift to entrepreneurship. I'll give you the short version <laughs> of the story. So I got there in 2004. Uh, our first speaker, it must have been the first week of class, was actually a keynote presentation of rather a fireside chat with President Ron Makeley. 
there with Jack Welch, the <laughs> world famous president of oh uh, of General Electric, and you know I got up I, I got up there and and you know tapped on the microphone, eighteen <laughs> years old, scrawny little kid, and uh, said, you know. Mr. Welch, sir, you've touched on entrepreneurship uh, three or four times here on your presentation. In your presentation, what do you think about Bryant University having an entrepreneurship major? And it was like crickets there. <laughs> it was nobody really cared about entrepreneurship. And they basically told me I should go, should have gone to Babson. And as an entrepreneurial uh, young man, I thought, okay, let me let me do something about this. And so we got together and started a chapter of the Collegiate Entrepreneurs Organization, grew that from about five people sitting in a room to 150 people, part of the organization. And Bryant's only a, a university of about 3,000, 3,500 students. So that was a large percentage of the or uh, university actually taking part in this entrepreneurship club. And so eventually we petitioned for a major minor. Uh, I was in the unique position of actually being able to interview a lot of the entrepreneurship professors for their jobs when they came in, which was, uh, again, Bryant had been very supportive to change and is very supportive of entrepreneurs, but it took them a little while to come around to it. So. We, we ended up winning uh, all sorts of national awards with the Collegiate Entrepreneurs Organization. And uh, yeah, in, I think it was by 2010, this was a year or two after I graduated, but it turned out that Bryant was, uh, it actually came out that Bryant, the number one declared major at the entire university was none other than entrepreneurship. So <laughs> it was really cool to see it. It took a while. It was a a lot of hard work uh, and and really cooperation. Uh, a lot of hard work, not just on my part, but by everybody. Um, and you know, cooperation with the university. And uh, yeah, it was it, it was a really just a great lesson in seeing innovation in a place. Like I started off this little tangent, saying how there was a lot of pressure right there to go and work at Fidelity across the street. Fidelity's one of their corporate headquarters is right across the street. People used to show up to, to class in suits and I didn't want to wear a suit. I am dressed up today here with a, <laughs> uh, a quarter, quarter zip sweatshirt on. So uh, yeah, there, there was a lot of pressure and I will say from family as well. Uh, I've, yeah, uh, from family as well and um, my parents have been very supportive of my entrepreneurial ventures, but extended family and, and expectations and, and stuff like that. Yeah, that stuff is real. So, yeah. So I'm curious, um, would you, what are your thoughts on like, um, I think it's, it might be Peter Thiel who offers high school students a hundred thousand dollar grant to skip college and basically come to his I don't know if it's like an incubator or somewhere. He basically thinks college is not as useful as just starting out and getting some hands-on mentorship from, you know, top tech executives and people in the field and just having people explore their ideas instead of going and maybe getting stifled down by the system and those 15 credits. And here you need to take these classes to graduate even though you have zero interest in them. So I'm curious what your thoughts on something like that is. Would you be an advocate of that? Or is it more like just kind of depends on the person? I would say both. I would say, uh, in, in fact, I was an advocate uh, for that program, that specific uh, program through the Teal Foundation. And I think it was a great idea to offer $100,000 for young people, 18 year olds to drop out of school and uh, try to start their own business. Now, you know, very few of them were successful, which is how, which is how entrepreneurship is. Uh, and a lot of them ended up going back to school. I know, you know, I know some of some of their fellows and I uh, have talked to them at length, especially when I was running under 30 CEO.com. And Look, I, th I think it's a great idea. 18, what do you have to lose? You can always go back to school. So why not, especially if there is proper support from 
someone like Peter Thiel, yeah, absolutely, take that check and and run with it, please. Yeah. Um, I do want to ask a few questions about Under 30 CEO and then obviously get into Under 30 experiences, but real quick before we do that, um, so, I mean, back to your podcast a little bit, I mean, you've had some pretty incredible people on there and successful people. You know, you've had Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, um, Howard Schultz, who is, uh, I think, now former Starbucks CEO. Um, you've had some other people like Tom Bailu. Bile- How do you say his last name? Uh, I think it's Billu. Billu? Um, yeah. Okay. But yeah, so you've had some pretty incredible people. I mean, when I was just going through your show and just like downloading some episodes, I started racking a ton up. I'm like, there's no way I'm going to be able to listen to all these before the interview. But um, so I'm curious with all these people you've talked to, I think you have close to 136 episodes out right now. What are some of the main takeaways or lessons that you've learned from these people that you've been able to talk to for maybe only 20 minutes or 25 minutes like Kareem Abdul to people you've had some longer conversations with? Sure. And and, uh, just a slight correction. Uh, It wasn't Howard Schultz. It was uh, Howard Bihar, and they worked hand in hand okay. together uh, as the president and CEO. But okay. uh, yeah, sure. I mean, uh, take him for example. He's all about servant leadership and uh, trying to use the power that he has to be able to impact change in the world and to help people start businesses and uh you know he he wrote a book and he was generous generous enough to uh give my listeners an hour of his time and so geez overarching themes and uh lessons learned i would say well for one that the most interesting people to speak with are not always the most famous so Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, in fact, I was so excited. I hyped it up so much in my head. I did so much research. I mean, I'm a 1990s Lakers fan. I see you got your Bulls memorabilia up yeah. there and your, your Eastern Conference uh, final, you know, Eastern Conference <laughs> finals memorabilia over there. But you know, I come from a big Michigan State family, so I grew up a huge Magic Jan- Johnson fan. I still am. I mean, God, if I if I had the opportunity to talk to magic i don't know what i would do (laughs) but uh that being said kareem was very much used to speaking in short sound bites for uh television and so i'd ask him a question and he'd answer it in 15 (laughs) seconds and i'm like uh this is gonna be a really tough podcast and it was so just but on that same note that everyone is human you know it, it it fantastically famous People are human too, and uh, if I'm going to borrow a page out of Jocko Willink, this this Navy SEALs book, Extreme Ownership, that I really try to live by, I have to take ownership for it. It wasn't Kareem's fault. I just didn't do a good enough job warming up to him uh, or warming him him up to want to talk to me for hours on end. And, you know, that's that's very difficult to do over, over Skype uh, or Skype audio. So... Or maybe I didn't set expectations properly. Anyhow, um, geez, main takeaways from the podcast. I really try to just find out what drives people and find out what message is most important for them to be able to put out there in the world. And so I try to ask them deeper questions and I try to start out with their story and that's what they know best that gets them talking and that gets the you know everybody loves to to, most people love to speak about themselves or at least it's what they know best so they're they're able to do that and uh, once you get them going you really do realize that most people who I've of course hand selected uh, to be on the show really care about the world around them and really care about the success of others and do genuinely want to make the world a better place. How much time and effort that they spend on that is is really pretty impressive. That's cool. And so what are 
being on like the interviewer side, because I'm sure you know with past companies, you've been on the other end of things quite often and talking to the press or media and getting interviewed like you are now as well. But so being on the other end of it and talking to these people and kind of having that ability to control the conversation how you desire to, what are some ways that, or not ways, but some takeaways from that that you've maybe implemented and allowed you to kind of look at your business or the way you run things in your own life in a different way? Like, are there any lessons you've taken from being on that end or skills you've learned that have helped translate into running your companies or just marketing or messaging or anything like that? That's a good question. So it's a tough one too, which makes it a good question. (laughs) Uh, And I guess that's the point, right? If you ask difficult questions, that's when you're going to cut through a lot of the fluff. And naturally, I also consume a lot of content. I read 50 books in 2018 and uh, I'm you know, listen to probably at least an hour of podcasts every day. And uh, I'm skeptical that not everything, you know, there's a, a, a counter opinion to everything. And I'm not a argumentative person or a confrontational person by nature. And it's very easy in the moment to agree with the advice that someone's give, giving. But A, it has to be right for the person who's listening at that present moment of their life, which oftentimes uh, I just had I just had a guy on um, the, the podcast who was very much into seeing the opposite opinions of things and had made a, a you know, great name for himself um, just by looking at a piece of advice someone uber famous was giving and then saying actually the converse of that is true which it usually is true so it depends on the situation and so it's interviewing these people have have made me a a good listener uh i will very often agree with what this person is saying at the time also because i steer them in a certain direction I do have an agenda for a lot of the podcasts, and that's probably clear to my long-term, uh, long-time listeners. And I try to steer the the direction of of where we're going. Uh, but that's kind of the job of a CEO is to ask questions, not necessarily to have the answers. And yes, you probably do have an agenda for your company. So if you can ask the right questions lead at, you know, you can ask leading questions and that can be dangerous as well because then you're influencing every single, you're not just asking someone point blank a question. You, you are influencing them to answer in a certain way. So that can also be dangerous. So there's two sides to every story, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit more about your story then. And, um, I'm, we'll kind of focus on mostly on under 30 experiences, um, but walk me a little bit through kind of your timeline uh, for the listeners who may not have heard of you or don't really know anything about under 30 CEO and under 30 experiences. Um, so when did you start under 30 CEO and what were the early days of that like? I know you and your uh, co-founder, Jared O'Toole, I think you guys started it for like close to like 100 or 150 dollars so kind of walk me through your timeline and where i guess from starting that to where you are now obviously in a more concise way than uh maybe some other (laughs) you know you could talk about that for the next half hour i'm sure but just kind of the overarching uh timeline for that okay so get to the point don't go on as long (laughs) as i've gone on already on this podcast okay got it no 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 no, no, i'm kidding (laughs) Um, okay, so 2008 graduated school. You heard what uh, went on at Bryant University. I had been surrounded by all these smart, young, innovative, passionate people. Graduated, moved back to uh, Poughkeepsie, New York area, and I was like, "Oh, uh, Poughkeepsie, New York is was not exactly at the time a hotbed of uh, economic innovation." So. 
uh, Jared and I sitting on our front porch, uh, one of our parents' front porches, rather, uh, drinking Miller Lights, said, you know what, we need to build community online because that's where we think the world is, is really going. Sure enough, we were right. There were all sorts of people in this economic recession, young people that couldn't get jobs, that were being laid off, that had their job offers retracted. And uh, we were able to bring young people who wanted to really make something of themselves during this trying economic time all together online at under30co.com, our media site where we shared news, advice, interviews, articles from young people who were very successful. And fast forward a few years, that was very, you know, it's a very difficult model, especially at that time. Uh, Right now, it's probably a little bit easier if you want to become a full-time blogger. There's, There's a lot of other models to follow. But this is in 2008. I mean, Facebook was two years old, right? Uh, Or four years old. Twitter was zero years old uh, at the time. And how do you get people to a website, et cetera? So we figured all that out. We grew it to about a half a million monthly readers. And we still were looking for other ways to monetize the site in addition to advertising and selling workshops and events and, and Uh, online courses and stuff like that. And I was invited to Iceland uh, to very randomly take a look at the effects of climate change on young entrepreneurs' businesses. And I went there and saw those glaciers and those volcanoes and those waterfalls. And I said, wow, uh, I need to be doing more of this. Why am I living in New York City where I don't have access to things that I really love? which are in the great outdoors, uh, which are, you know, adventure and and exploring and all the things that I am lucky enough to be able to do uh, on an almost daily basis now. And so, yeah, that was really the catalyst. We brought our blog readers from under 30 CEO on an entrepreneurial entrepreneurs retreat to Iceland. We ran another one to Iceland later that year because it was such a hit. I started traveling all over the world as a digital nomad, and uh, yeah, the business has has grown significantly uh, since then. And this year, we made the Inc. 5000 list. We are the 801st fastest growing private company in America. (laughs) Thank you. Very exciting. Uh, So um, you talk about this Iceland trip in a few posts and kind of that, that change that had on you. And um, I think it was on your most recent conversation with uh, Raj Nation, where he's interviewing you. And uh, you talked a little bit about how that first trip, when you brought people to Iceland, you know, you were having to interview people, they had to apply, they had to be accepted. And that first trip, you mentioned, almost failed and almost didn't work out. Could you expand on, like, what happened with that trip and, like, why it ended up almost not working? Sure. I mean, just nobody signed up. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> literally what happened is we put it on our website. And uh, okay, so it's kind of crazy. I went in March of 2012 to Iceland. And uh, long story short, had the not so brilliant uh, idea of trying to organize an international trip over none other than Memorial Day weekend, which is like <laughs> two months later. And get people to sign up and, you know, flights to the tiny island of Iceland skyrocketed at this time. Uh, And this is in 2008 when Iceland Air wasn't flying all over the United States like they are now. Uh, Or sorry, this was in 2012. And um, yeah, so I had one buddy who wanted to come, Ray Land, uh, entrepreneur from Brantford, Florida. And uh yeah, basically he called me and said, hey, yeah, this would have been great if uh, if this was in, in 2013, the following year, you could have given me some time. You know, entrepreneurs are busy people. <laughs> he said, yeah, he, he went on this whole big thing and said, yeah, I'm really sorry. Uh, 
that I haven't got back to you over the last few weeks. I, you know, we just kind of heard crickets. Nobody wanted to come, we thought. And uh, he said, but you know what, buddy, I'm in. I support anything you do. We called another friend, conferenced him in, and uh, he was in. And so at least we had a, a guy's trip to Iceland <laughs> running. And so we were three, and then the snowball started forming. And if we had those two guys in, we attracted more people, and ended up filling the trip, uh, having a blast. So yeah, it just didn't happen because people were like, what are these bloggers bringing people to Iceland for? And why are they trying to do it on such a short timeline? And flights got really expensive. So yeah, we almost failed. We had no, no idea what we were doing. <laughs> what were, um, when, cause I know you kind of had to scout out the places when you started. So you went, re- was the next year, uh, your second ever trip to Iceland? Was that the second trip total or was that, no, so we then turned it around and did one in October. Okay. So came back to New York after that trip to Iceland, packed up my apartment in New York, uh, and set out for Costa Rica, Nicaragua, traveled all over Central America. Uh, and then I had then headed back to Iceland uh, to run this trip in October. We saw the Northern Lights. Uh, oh. Yeah, it was it was really amazing. Uh, then I took off personally to travel to Indonesia, and uh, yeah, by then it was fair to say I had the travel bug. Oh yeah, once you get it, can't stop. <laughs> That's it. Uh, so when you were going to these other places and you started trying to think of what are some other trips that we can run, what did you have a certain criteria that you were looking for in destinations or experiences? Were you listening a lot to other people or to like scouring web forums for places that were really popular? Like what was your mindset and kind of your strategy when you were first starting to try to get some other trips around the world beyond Iceland and Costa Rica and some places? Yeah, I mean, things just happened randomly, serendipitously, uh, not so serendipitously, (laughs) so... On that very first trip, uh, we had a girl by the name of Melissa there, and she founded something called the Green Program, uh, the Global Renewable Energy Education Network, and they bring engineering students down to Costa Rica on study tours. And she said, you ought to come to Costa Rica and check that out. And so I actually went on a preview program with a bunch of uh, college professors to check out what they do uh, there in Costa Rica, spent a week with those professors, got a nice sampling of what a program would look like. And then I took off for the next three weeks to travel around Costa Rica. Happened that Jared, my business partner, was at an event for under 30 CEO at Thomas Alva Edison's house uh, in New Jersey. Uh, Obviously he's deceased his estate. (laughs) And someone from an organization called Opportunity International was there, told him about their work that they were doing in Nicaragua in microfinance. And Jared was like, oh, uh, my business partner's kind of close to there. He kind of looked at a map and saw Nicaragua was the country to the north of Costa Rica. And he said, I bet he'd be willing to come up and and check out uh, your project there. And sure enough, uh, I was. So... Hopped over the border, you know, Central American border crossings on foot are uh, a little bit interesting. Uh, it's, you know, it's a pretty hardcore backpacker experience. And um, yes, yeah, so I mean, these are examples of how these things started. Again, a random invitation to come to Iceland, a random in- invitation to come to Nicaragua. Uh, not so random to come to Costa Rica because at least it was a a legitimate program uh, that I was part of. And uh, yeah, another, the the next trip to Indonesia, it was kind of wild. Geez, there's, it's a long story there, but basically I was invited there uh, again through under 30 CEO to meet with other young entrepreneurs and uh, help them get press for their businesses. And so, yeah, I mean, this is kind of how it started. And then, and by then, you know, after that year, I was a pretty, pretty well-versed traveler uh, across three different continents. And uh, I knew what I was doing, at least as a backpacker at that point. And then, 
you know, you can you meet people who tell you about awesome places and you start to learn how the industry works a little bit more. And uh, yeah, we, we went from there. So in more recent years, as you've gotten larger and grown and um, gotten trips, I, I, you're running close to, th- is it 300 trips a year now? Yes. So how have you now today kind of focused your um, energy into finding new trips? Are you, you know, are you still trying to stick to kind of your vision and places you've been and stick with that? Or are you really listening a lot to your customers and people in the community and really kind of basing a lot of your decisions on where you're getting requests for and say, hey, you know, we really want to go to um, China or Japan or, you know, places that you aren't currently running trips and are you know what's the balance between following your own vision for the company and following the requests and kind of feedback you're getting from customers? Sure, and uh, yeah, to be to be clear, uh, well, you nailed it. That it's all about the community, and at first it was about my own travel experiences, and I, from what I just told you, because that was my travel experiences. Yeah, I went to Indonesia, but nobody was asking to go to Indonesia. And in fact, uh, nobody asked to go to Nicaragua. And it turned out to be a really tough sell because of political, you know, different political issues and and things people heard about Nicaragua or or had never heard of Nicaragua, right? That's a very difficult thing to, to sell. Our first trip was just something that I envisioned in our head uh, to Nicaragua, it, you know, again, that was our fourth trip ever, but it was called the microfinance surf camp. Now, who the hell would go <laughs> on that? Thank God a dozen people signed up to go and it went extremely well. People had the time of their lives, including me, but we continue to ask, we continue to ask. And so uh, people told us where they wanted to go. Uh, Ireland was a great example. I was with a group in Iceland and they were all talking about how they wanted to visit Ireland. And I said, well, if we organize this, you know, I basically told them, I will fly to Ireland tomorrow and I will organize our reunion if that's something that you guys want to do. And they committed, they said, yes, I went and we've been running Ireland trips ever since. Now, of course, we have Irish guides, uh, we have you know local experts who help us in all of these different countries and the community, you know, we have a a council, an alumni council that we ask a lot of questions to and survey our, not only our mailing list, but our our alumni groups. And I try to spend a lot of time at our meetups with our alumni and ask them about their experiences and see where they want to go. Or when I'm in Costa Rica, I try to have dinner or go to yoga with the groups and, and just chat with them and get to know them. And so uh, yeah, first it was just me with a backpack going all over the place, but uh, the community is is way bigger than than me at this point. Yeah, the community is something you've really talked a lot about with Raj and the importance of that. And I mean, it's so cool because I've I've never gone on a trip with under thirty experiences, but I'm a part of the U thirty X Chicago community, and. Perfect. So could you expand a little bit more on community and I mean, what is, was that always intentional for you? Like this needs to be at the forefront, you know, this needs to be kind of our leading purpose is, you know, it's obviously a service oriented company. So you need to think about the customer, but building that community and building it outside of people who haven't even bought anything from your company, you know, can you expand on that idea a little bit more and how that's helped you in your growth and just overall company? Sure. So, I mean, it's always been about community for us, although I did go on about my personal story of of travel, but it's it's always been about community for, well, I'll say for me personally, uh, or I could take you back to the 2008 to under 30 CEO where we said, we should start a community. In fact, before we were a blog and a, a media site, we were a Ning network. If anybody even knows what that is, a it's Ning a Ning kind of network. A, yeah, it's a uh, like a white label service where you can create your own social media platform that looks like Facebook. But imagine a private Facebook, but just for uh, young entrepreneurs. 
and opportunities to network, et cetera. That was our original iteration. So it was all about community at that point. And I just went on about Bryant uh, from 2004 to 2008. And that was about building community. So we already had pre-existing meetups where we built a lot of trust with our blog readers of under 30 CEO, you know, starting in probably start them in 2009, 2010. So we've always done these meetups because it was about bringing offline, bringing online connections offline. So now with under 30 experiences, we already had a meetup model that worked for under 30 CEO. It gradually shifted from trips for entrepreneurs uh, for the first year or two to trips to anybody who was cool and wanted to come on an international adventure with us. And we've always wanted to be an inclusive community rather than an exclusive community. So I don't ever want to say, you know, in the early days, this is when we made that shift. We were like, forget, you know, forget having to apply, forget having to have a business. Uh, You know, we were sitting in a room thinking, shoot, should there be a certain revenue that people need to hit so that they're legit to come on our trips? These were the under 30 CEO days. But no, we just said, if you're cool, come. And we always ended up having a blast. And so that's why, Lee, nobody cares at an under 30 experiences event in Chicago. If you've been on a trip, if you just pop in and say, hey, yeah, I just want to meet some new people. Or uh, what we always say, we like to take what we do on the trips back home with us. So that's sharing good meal and having a drink with people. That's uh, getting in the outdoors, you know, going kayaking on the Chicago River or or whatever it is, uh, that is, that's about, you know, it's about connection. It's about community. And there are a lot of travel companies out there. You know, you can, yeah, the, the travel industry has been around for, for a very long time. Uh, but the community model is is a little bit of a new thing as far as people building companies around community. And uh, yeah, we've really been able to to do that authentically with under 30 experiences. Yeah, that's really cool because, I mean, if you're a solo traveler and you go on this trip with a ton of other people, you know, you're there's certain things that people back home, you just can't really explain or, you know, inside jokes or experiences you exactly. have with these people. It's just, you know, you get back home, it's almost... It's like not disappointment, but you get you just can't explain some of the things, and and you know people back home just don't know what to ask sometimes, and it's so that's cool that you can kind of come back and still continue that connection with people, even if they were on that trip or maybe have been on it with other another group. Like that's really cool, and I like I like that you guys do that because as a fellow traveler, you know I solo traveled for a while, you know it's. There's still some people I connect with who live across the world. It's just like, hey, miss you. Like, hope you're doing well. And so just that community that you make, that's really cool. Um, no, yeah, that, that's exactly right. And, uh, you know, for people who want to come and check out our trips, yeah, pop in. See if the group is your vibe. See if they're cool uh, before you go and spend $1,000 on a trip somewhere. Yeah. Speak, so is this, I think you said that nearly 70% of people who've, gone on a trip have returned for a trip with you guys um with the in the Raj Nation podcast which I I don't know what like a good statistic for that is but that seems pretty impressive that 70% of people will go on a trip and you know there some are inexpensive relatively but there's other ones you know if you're going all the way to New Zealand obviously going to be a little bit more pricey but that these people are willing to come back and say you know I had such a good time I don't want to go on a trip of my own. I want to travel with you guys. That's so cool. And along with community, what are some other aspects of your company and the trips that you guys run that you think have helped um, allow, like just allow this to happen? Sure. So first of all, yeah, I don't have the the up-to-date numbers (laughs) on on our rebooking rate, but it's extremely high and I'm sure it's extremely high uh, for the industry. But uh, Lee, do you mind repeating it, exactly what the question was? Yeah. So along with community, what are some other ways that you think have contributed to this high um, return rate? 
Yeah, I mean, again, I've, I've touched on authenticity, trying to create a safe place, which is, is I guess that falls under community. Uh, I guess to use the word community in another way, uh, the local communities we also speak about quite a bit when we go to these places. So how can under 30 experiences keep their money in the local community? So if you if you go on a trip to Peru, for example, how can we best support these communities? And so we have a project uh, with the local indigenous people who don't have transportation to go up to Cusco to <laughs> to sell their their textiles and we get to have a cultural exchange with them and bring travelers to their area you know the people most of the people in the community don't even speak spanish they you know they speak quechua their native language and so we have local guides who you know that can translate quechua to spanish to english and uh we can you know we're able to create a bond with a lot of the local organizations and and with the local communities and that's something that you don't just get as a traveler or that you wouldn't just get as a tourist right uh, the opportunity to have a, a true cultural exchange and uh, make sure that your money is going to a good cause and so that's one of the things uh, that really you know in addition to our our capital C community uh, model that we talk about all the time. That's something that keep, keeps people coming back to under 30 experiences. Um, yeah, I mean, so many of the things, like A, it's also just easy, right? Uh, somebody said once, you put the easy button on travel. I think that's how they said it. So, uh, because you just come to our book, our website, and book a trip and you can get back to work and not have to worry about it. And when the time comes, they know that they'll be safe. They know that uh, we'll create the best itinerary for young people. According to the feedback, we take our feedback very seriously, according to what the people like, uh, what are travelers like, what are community likes? I can't stop using that word, I'm sorry. <laughs> and yeah, just trying to, to do our best, especially kind of on the non-trip side of things here in Austin at the office. I mean, our, our uh, sales and customer service always just talks about do good, right? Do the best that we can with the, you know, it, with the situation at hand. And we try to go above and beyond uh, as much as possible to, to make people happy. And that's at the end of the day, uh, we do this because we love it. We want to share that gift of travel, if you will. And uh, yeah, that's that's worked out well for us so far. And so I don't know why I just thought of this. And sorry that I keep referencing this, the Raj Nation interview, but I swear I listen to some other podcasts as well. But No, it's cool. You got to hang out with him. He's in Chicago. <laughs> Is he really? Yeah, I'll have to introduce you to. Oh, that would be awesome. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so one of the things that you guys talked about a little bit that really resonated with me was kind of leaving your ego at the door, whether as a le leader or you know CEO of a company or anyone in your company, leave your ego at the door. No job is beneath you. Can you explain a little bit more about you know just kind of checking your ego? I mean, you know, you've been CEO of a company. You sold it to rich twenty something. You're the CEO of a second company. You're 800 and was it 801st on the Inc. 1000 fastest growing companies. You know all this cool things. You know, how do you continue to kind of check your ego and make sure that that doesn't hinder your success with the company or in your own personal life? Sure. So we're gonna have to link up this episode for people because uh, we <laughs> referenced it so much at, at this point. Uh, it's yeah, it's with my friend Rajiv Nathan. Raj Nation, uh, I'll give him a shout out there. Uh, but he's also a yoga teacher in addition to a, st a Chicago startup guy. And he's a multiple time traveler worth under 30 experiences and uh, one of my close friends at, at this point. Um, but, you know, ego in a, a yogic way is something even 
beyond when we're talking about at one point on our website it may still say it no egos divas and complainers <laughs> because it doesn't say this part for sure but nobody wants to travel with those people so check yeah check your ego at the door but as an entrepreneur it's really important to be self-aware and so on the live different podcast i talk or, or i have interviews with people who are experts in meditation and in emotional awareness and in uh, mindset and personal development and these are things that i've worked on from a very young age uh the the meditation and and the mindfulness really since i don't know since things were extremely stressful running under 30 ceo uh, until now i've i've really devoted a, a large portion of my life to that but you know, personal development since i was since i was mowing lawns i'd have tony robbins literally cassette tapes in there but just knowing i think that first of all understanding how you come off to people and so i think that's something that i'm very conscious of yet you also have to be unapologetic at times. It goes back to what we were talking about at the at the beginning. There's two sides to everything. And if you really believe in what you're saying, then say it and you don't really need to apologize. Uh, but yeah, I, um, I, I think it just, I try to be as mindful as possible, understand how people around me are perceiving certain situations, but also how I'm perceiving situations. So I talked about earlier, how I have an ability to steer conversations, right? But I don't sometimes, I sometimes I don't want to steer conversations of the company too much. And I just need to shut up and not even ask any questions and see where things develop so I can get a real read on things uh, so people can actually think for themselves. And you're paying the people around you Hopefully, you're paying the people around you to think. Now, yeah, you can pay people around you to be cogs in the wheel, right? But then you have to do all the thinking, and two heads are always better than one, even if they don't agree. Hopefully, they don't agree, and that's another thing that we really encourage at Under 30 Experiences is debate and not agreeing and not being a company of yes people, so... I hope that uh, answers your question a little bit. Yeah, definitely. So what are some ways that someone could start with today or this week to try to start to develop that self-awareness? And I think everyone kind of thinks, you know, yeah, I'm self-aware and I, I kind of know what I'm doing. But there are many times where you just kind of go unconscious and in a conversation or whatever. And you look back after and you're like, whoa, what, what was I doing during that? So what are some ways that you'd mention meditation and some mindfulness type things, but what are some easy or some good ways that someone could start with to try to start to develop that mindfulness and that self-awareness and kind of start that journey? Sure. So I think for one, just getting up in the morning, well, forget it. If anybody's watching on video, I don't know if you're going to do anything with the, the video, Lee, but I'll post right it. there, yeah. right there, I just had to take a, a breath. Someone knocked on the door of the, the co-working phone booth, and I started to get a little distracted. I checked the time. I said, well, maybe they have it booked after me, but I don't think so, So, and I at least have two more minutes, so uh, I had to take a breath and center myself and think, all right what's the topic at hand? Because, I mean, I've worked with neuroscientists who have observed with electrodes on my, heads that, on my head that I do brown out at times. Uh, and, you know, the person is still outside. And so <laughs> it, we live in an extremely, uh, extremely distracted culture. I'm waving my iPhone for anybody who who can't see it with all the, the push alerts and, and all of this stuff, which I have turned off, by the <laughs> way, and push alerts at all times. So just try to take a deep breath once in a while or before you start your day, center yourself and make sure that uh, you are 
just in alignment with who you want to be every day. I think that's a really good place to start. So if you're setting your goals, uh, yeah, take a, take a deep breath and, and think critically. I got a friend at the at the phone booth. I think I'm getting kicked out here, but Lee, I'll, I'll take you for a little walk with me. How's that sound? Perfect. Let's do it. All right. Are uh, our Kat and Lindsay in the office today? Uh, Kat and Lindsay are at the office. Would you like to <laughs> talk to them? Yeah, let's go say hi real quick. All right. Give me one second here. All right. So if anyone is just listening to this on uh, on Apple Podcasts or on the website and just the audio, the video will be posted up on the website and YouTube. So if you want to uh, go to that and check out Matt walking us around the office a little bit, go and go and do that now. <laughs> All right, here we go. Hang on. Give me one second. Dang, this looks like a sweet office. <laughs> It's it's pretty cool. Sorry to the listeners if this is boring for anybody, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I got kicked out of the the phone booth. But hey, cat, say hi to say hi to Lee. From the hey, from. how's oh, it going? You talked to Jenny, I think yesterday. I there's did talk Jenny to Jenny. Yeah, hello. <laughs> and there's there's Lindsay. I got kicked out of the phone booth. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, anyway, yeah, what's uh, well, yeah, we we'll, we can uh, start. What else to... is is going on? Really no. <laughs> Happy to happy to chat. Yeah, we'll start to wrap it up a little bit. But so I think. No, oh, you can see the backyard. Oh, beautiful. Oh, you got some dogs out there too. Oh my gosh. I think bringing dogs yeah, into the workspace is such an awesome thing. That needs to happen more often. <laughs> For sure. Um, Good stress relief. Yeah, absolutely. So a little bit back to travel. Um, I think. It's not a cliche, but the words like life-changing experience and travel, you know, you hear that a lot. And if you've never traveled or done a trip um, of your own or with a company like yours, it might almost seem like a cliche and you might be a little bit skeptical of it. Like, oh, yeah, you know, go on a week trip and my life will change, whatever. Um, But it, it can happen. and It's amazing. You know, you talked about Iceland and standing on top of that mountain. Um, and I've had similar experiences as well. So to any skeptics out there or people who maybe have traveled and haven't had as big of a shift in their life, you know, what would you say to them? Yeah, I mean, I think, so we don't push the life-changing experiences too hard in our marketing just because we want people to come and experience the magic of travel for themselves. So, I mean, it's, it's exploration. If anything, it's just a time to get outside of your normal routine. And yeah, my life has been changed by travel. I hope people recognize that (laughs) at this point in the interview, if they're still, if they've gotten anything out of it, but uh, that's about me, you know, but this, uh, I want the content from this interview to be actionable stuff that people uh, can, at least people can draw from, from my story and the story of under 30 experiences. So if they want to come on a trip or they want to book on a trip on their own somewhere, it, it does not have to be with them. I, I am an advocate of travel and go out and, and try it for yourself and just see how your perspective changes from uh, being outside of your, your comfort zone a little bit. And I know that sounds cliche, but uh, yeah, I mean, when I was telling you about the central. Uh, you're cutting out a little bit. Be outside. The uh, yeah, outside the, of your comfort zone. The video and audio. Am I, am kinda, I losing you for a second? Yeah, a little bit. Um, cut off right before kind of the comfort zone stuff. Sure. So uh, yeah, I mean, it sounds a little cliche to get out of your comfort zone, but that's that's the real deal when you're outside of your own culture and your Starbucks and your morning coffee isn't right there on every street corner say, oh, yeah, okay, uh, this is something a little bit different. And there's so much value in just breaking your routine and uh, yeah, thinking a little bit differently. Yeah. Um, and so kind of one last question, then uh, we'll finish up here. Um, talk to me a little bit about vulnerability, and especially as a leader, and, you know, where you think you kind of always need to show strength and you th- seem like you know what's going on. How... What are your thoughts on you know being vulnerable and being open to even just like saying I don't know what to do or I don't know what you know is going on here and showing maybe not weakness but 
just showing that you don't have everything figured out and being vulnerable in your own life and opening up to people and kind of sharing your thoughts and some things that you might be get judged on and there's nothing you can really do about it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that old school style of leadership is bullshit in a way. I hope I can swear on it. You can, yeah. <laughs> because, yeah, I think it is, it's not, uh, it's not real. You know what I mean? People aren't just robots and people do have feelings. And if you want to be perceived you want people to understand your point of view on things, if you want to have influence, if you want to uh, convince someone to do something, which happens all the time in business, you need to open up to them and show them that you are a real person and you struggle at times just like they do. So uh, don't be afraid. Uh, don't be afraid to do that and don't be afraid to really look inward and be honest with yourself and be vulnerable with yourself and not just block the fact that you may be struggling or you may need someone to talk to because that's not doing you any favors whatsoever just to say, oh yeah, I'm fine and, and believing that because then you're, you're just believing, you're drinking your own Kool-Aid and uh, yeah, that's, that's not doing you any favors. Yeah. Great. Um, well, sorry, I know we're a little bit over time, but um, is there anything that we haven't discussed today or question I didn't ask or any kind of final thoughts that you'd want to give to our listeners or viewers of the video? No, I mean, I think it, it would just be that uh, people should go out and explore for themselves. I can't tell anybody at this point anything more than they already probably have a calling to do somewhere in uh oh we're cutting out again yeah there's been out of comfort zone or what he starts or whether it's uh asking someone on a date get out of your comfort zone a little bit that is not going to hurt you whatsoever and uh yeah for anybody who wants to connect i'd, I'd love to do that as well yeah, so what are the uh, the best places someone can get in contact with you if they just want to say hello or ask another follow-up question or find out more about Under 30 Experiences? Sure. Uh, so the best way to connect with me personally, I would say send me an Instagram message, Matt Wilson TV. You can say, hey, I heard you on Lee's podcast. You really sucked. Uh, <laughs> or tell me, tell me what you liked about it. I mean, I, I'm there. I'm out there to engage with people and, and build community. So that's really good. And then if you want to come on a trip, under30experiences.com uh, is a really good place to start. Uh, yeah, the trips <laughs> the trips sell themselves. I don't need to sell anybody. And if anybody wants to call, I will say if anybody is interested in some of the yoga or mindfulness stuff that we talked about. We're running a, uh, we we'll run trips to Costa Rica and Bali and Thailand, which I am personally on uh, in, and a participant in uh, that are yoga and mindfulness based. So yeah, would would love to actually hang out with anybody for a week if they'd like. Terrific. And I will link all of that in the show notes as well if anyone needs to, uh, to find it through that. Um, but hey, thank you so much for talking with me today. I mean, you're always welcome back on. I have a million other questions and different areas we could talk about. So really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, just awesome, awesome to talk with you. And uh, if I'm ever back in Austin or we are in the same place at the same time, it'd be great to, to link up and grab a beer or coffee or something. Sounds good. Yeah, let me know. Sorry about the interruptions, but I uh, had a blast. Thank you very much. <laughs> no worries. All right. Well, hey, have a great day and uh, look forward to following your journey more and under 30 experiences and hopefully get on a trip with you guys pretty soon here. So, Sounds good, Lee. I appreciate it. All right. Great to talk with you, Matt. See you later. Yeah, man. Sounds good. <laughs> Thanks. Keep in touch.